Good morning. Uh, this is going to be the networking session uh, at Hot Chips, and uh, I guess you know I used to be on the compute side, moved to networking side about a dozen years ago, and I was was quite amazed at how much complexity, how much really interesting things are being done in networking, and I think that's only gotten more so. And I think you'll you'll uh, I hope uh, seeing all the crowd out here that uh, those are you know folks who will recognize that uh, that there is a lot of interesting networking stuff versus just the early risers, if you will. But uh, anyways, just to get things going, we're going to see all three, or at least three major portions of networking here, both in terms of uh, the first talk on more at the phi layer, and then a talk at the uh, switching layer, and then another talk at the host adapter layer. So uh, without uh, taking any more time, I want to introduce uh, Ramin Sharani and Ramin Verjadra from Aquantia, who are going to uh, tell us about the, the very hard problem of making 10G based T uh, work. Gentlemen. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. OK, let's start with the Ethernet history. Uh, when I first joined the Ethernet industry in 1987, 10 megabit Ethernet was running on coaxial uh, cable, on the, if you recall, on the thin uh, black or the yellow thick ones. And uh, that was the true CSMA CD, carrier sense multiple access with collision domain, the invention of Bob, Bob Metcalf. I've seen the progression of Ethernet uh, as it got deployed over twisted pair, and I've seen it go, we've all seen it go from 10 meg to 100 meg to gigabit, and now recently uh, uh, on the copper, it's going to 10 gigabit per second. As most of you know, Ethernet is very commonplace. It's the most dominant local area networking protocol, and over a billion uh, twisted pair ports have shipped so far. So what does 10 g -based t mean? 10G stands for 10 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, sorry, 10G stands for 10 gigabit per second data rate. Base is an acronym for baseband versus broadband modulation. And T refers to twisted pair and LDPC encoding. So let's talk about uh, power and density of the PHI, which is a key enabler. Uh, low power and small footprint of the PHI IC are the main catalyst for real market deployment. On the server side, as we all know, uh, airflow restrictions on the motherboard dictate uh, passive cooling. And to get to passive cooling, an integrated dual port Mac Phi chip needs to consume less than 10 watts. Over the past five or six years, over a number of generations of product in 10G based T, starting from 90 nanometer now to 40 nanometer, such a product is uh, realizable. And soon, in the next few months, you will see the Romney generations of servers enabled with such ICs. For high-speed density switches, as you can see in the picture, it is desirable to fit uh, eight ports. It's desirable to fit eight ports uh, of phi behind a stacked RJ45. The RJ45 stack RJ45 basically consists of a RJ45 jack with integrated magnetics, right? In such a configuration, you got the most board efficient implementation of the phi. Obviously, your Y dimension is the smallest possible. Your, your MDI traces from the phi to the mag jack are the shortest. So from a signal fidelity perspective, it's very clean. And from a front to back airflow perspective, you have a very clean and you have a very consistent uh, temperature profile. A Quantia's 25 by 25 quad is the only product in the world that enables single row implementation for multi-port switches uh, in the industry today. So let's talk about the 10G based T environment for a second. 10G based T is designed to run over 55 meters of CAT5 or 100 meters of CAT6 or CAT7. We're running, effectively, we're running 2.5 gigabits per second, full duplex over each pair. And the transmission is done uh, you know, receiving and transmitting on the same line. So there's significant echo challenges. And as you can see, four pairs of wire, even though the twist rates are different, you still get significant 
near-end crosstalk and far-end crosstalk uh, noise from the adjacent pairs. Now, in a typical uh, data center application, where the wires are pulled in a six around one configuration, as you can see here, there could be a scenario where you have a victim cable and you have six aggressors, and all of these aggressors are basically inducing alien next on top of the uh, victim cable. All of these impairments have to be taken into account for a proper design of a 10G base D for it to operate, to, for it to have a chance of operating at 100 meters. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's worth noting that uh, the insertion loss for 10G base D at Nyquist is about 45 dB. And uh, comparing that to the gigabit previous generation, we had uh, at Nyquist, we had about 20 dB of insertion loss. The Shannon limit margin for um, 10G base D is less than 2 dB. Right? So basically what the IEEE standard did is they pressed as much as possible into the wire, getting it very close to the Shannon limit, whereas the previous generation was uh, greater than 20 dB limit. Duplex transmission is there, and the echo power at the end of a 100 meters cable is about 6 to 9 dB greater than the signal power. The near-end and far-end crosstalks are significant and has to be canceled. An alien crosstalk from the uh, adjacent 6 around 1 configuration has to be accounted for in chip design. So let's talk about the technical requirements. Industry requirements are... Uh, from a bit error rate perspective, dictate a bit error rate of 10 to the minus 15, even though uh, the standard calls for 10 to the minus 12. To achieve uh, this level of uh, uh, bit error rate, a few things have to fall into place. From an equalization perspective, we need uh, pre-equalization, which is done in the form of Tom Linson Harishima precoding, and with a receive feed forward equalizer, as you will see in the next slide. From an echo cancellation, you need at least 60 dB of echo cancellation, 40 dB of next cancellation, and 20 dB of fixed cancellation. On top of that, you need to be very cognizant of radio frequency interference. As walkie-talkies are turned on, common mode couples onto the wire, and then it gets translated to differential. And you need to have UHF and VHF interference cancellation. After all of this, your bit error rate is nowhere near enough. And what you have to do, you have to throw a strong LDPC uh, at the problem, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, it's a 2048, uh, uh, three, uh, 320, uh, 328 parities and 328 equality node uh, LDPC. So let's talk about the top level architecture. So as you can see in this diagram, uh, the signal comes in through the line. It goes through a mag jack, which is a combination of a jack and an isolation transformer. We go through a summing node, through a uh, gain stage with some level of boost. We go through a high fidelity analog to digital converter. And at that point, the data is presented to digital. Uh, in the digital domain, majority of the digital logic, so in fact, 80% of the digital logic on our chip actually consists of digital uh, uh, FIRs, final impulse response filters, for feed forward equalization, RFI cancellation, FEX cancellation, NEXT cancellation, and ECHO cancellation. These are not based on uh, DSP processors. These are actually based on hardwired digital logic uh, that do about 10 terabits of operations per second to uh, detect the signal and be able to extract it from the noise. The data then is presented to the forward error correction in the form of LDPC. And post-LDPC, the bit error rate gets to better than 10 to the minus 12 and goes through the Ethernet physical uh, coding sublayer for descrambling and data uh, deciphering. And then the CERDIS actually takes it and gives it to the upper layer protocol. On the transmit side, what's worth mentioning is the existence of Tom Linson Harishima pre-coding as a pre-equalizer. Think of it as a sophisticated pre-equalizer, followed by a transmit DAC and a transmit driver, and the associated circuitry for echo cancellation. In fact, what we do is we do echo cancellation not only in analog, but we also do it in digital. So there's multiple prong of echo cancellation to get to the 60 dB desired level.
So de design challenges for 10G based these. Some of the ones that are worth mentioning in this presentation. Innovations in LDPC to achieve low error floor while maintaining low power. I'll cover that in a few slides next. Efficient implementation of cancelers, RF interference cancelling techniques, uh, high fidelity and low power data acquisition, on chip power management mechanisms, and on top of all of that, uh, sophisticated firmware deployment for interoperability and power management. So let's look at the forward error correction uh, in, in, in a few minutes, hopefully in less than five minutes. So LDPC provides about 10 dB of coding gain and gets us from a bit error rate of 10 to the minus three to better than 10 to the minus 12. A few, a few learnings that we've gone through at Aquantia, which is worth mentioning, and I'll detail in the next few slides, are ideally LDPC should be designed to handle 10 iterations. Iterations are when messages are passed from the parity to the equality node in computing and correcting the errors. But generally, almost all the time, three iterations are more than sufficient. We leverage this fact to actually do the LDPC design, as I'll show you in the next slide. LDPC code structures in general are inherently flawed in the sense that they have trapping sets. There are a specific code words in LDPC which are always undecodable, but the probability of happening of these code words are small. That's why you, know, you still get better than 10 to the minus 12 bit error rates. But we do have a technique to detect them and to correct them. Given the LDPC's 2048 equality and 384 parity nodes, if you do the math on the number of wires and the resolution required to get a digital circuit going, you will see that you're going to need about 200,000 wires going back and forth just for message passing, right? And if you just want to do a pure parallel implementation, it makes it impractical. So let's talk about uh, the time extension concept. As for the first learning that I mentioned above, uh, what we do with LDPC is we augment the LDPC with input FIFO and output FIFO. We heavily leverage the fact that the, error, the, error burst are, the errors are bursty, and in fact, what we can do is we can have some, uh, uh, we can have some uh, uh, frames stored in the, outside, uh, in the output FIFO, and Generally, for almost all the time, the decoder would resolve the decoding in three iterations, which is uh, you know, almost 99.9% .9 of the time. But in case one in 10,000, if a packet ever comes in that requires more than three iterations and it requires, let's say, 10 iterations, what we do is we store the incoming data on the input FIFO while the output FIFO maintains the uh, data to the associated circuitry, so maintains the data flow. And meanwhile, what the iterative decoder does, it actually gets, it borrows time, and it gets time to do 10 iterations. In doing so, effectively, we are running the LDPC at half speed. And as you can, as you can uh, easily see, half speed would save us a lot of power. In the next generation that uh, we've done, as an uh, additional technique that we've added to this, we've added a VCO ring oscillator and a supply regulator. And we look at the FIFO monitor, and based on the FIFO monitor signal, we do dynamic clock adjustment, and we do dynamic supply adjustment, right? The question is, well, how do you do dynamic supply adjustment? Well, on the chip for every digital block, we have a linear regulator built in, which, you know, your normal traditional headers, but we've turned them into linear regulators, and we are able with the processor's help, with the, external, with the internal processor's help, to monitor the FIFO and set up the regulator and set up the VCO. So you would actually get the most optimum power based on uh, the cable configuration. Let's quickly touch base on the LDPC error floor. So LDPCs are inherently flawed, as I said, because they do have error floors in the form of trapping sets. And effectively, what we've done in a nutshell is we've identified all of these trapping sets, we've tabulated them, and we have put them in a separate digital logic post the LDPC. And effectively, once we detect any of these trapping sets, we go ahead and decode the trapping sets 
and we correct the errors. So as you can see, with a low resolution implementation, you get the green line. With a better resolution, you get the black line. And with the LDPC decoder in a uh, bit error rate versus SNR curve, you actually get the red line. So basically, you improve the uh, error rate significantly. I'm not going to get too much into the wire complexity. I want to leave some time for my colleague here. But effectively, what this slide is saying is that we can go from 200K wires to 12K wires if we do serial communication in a bidirectional fashion. And however, the toggle rate significantly goes up. And the way to get around that would be to do uh, difference communication and only send the difference of the messages from every iteration to every iteration. Rami? Thank you very much, and uh, uh, good morning. I'm going to uh, cover the rest of the uh, architecture. Uh, as Ramin explained, the top-level architecture is very similar to the 1G architecture with, uh, with, with uh, certain subtleties, differences, in, in the terms of that the fact that you're using the LDPC for a higher gain, but in gigabit, you're using the Viterbi, which only provided 6 dB, which is not enough uh, coding gain for this case. And that will result into some architectural differences. But the rest is overall the same, but the complexity is significantly higher. We're doing 10 terabits of operation per second uh, in this architecture. So just uh, first, I'm going to cover this section of the digital cancelers, uh, that where the difference comes from. The fact that uh, for channel equalization, the low-pass channel equalization, uh, we have to use uh, some sort of decision feedback equalizer versus the high-pass filtering, because high-pass filtering will result in noise amplification that even for gigabit was not good enough. But to do this decision feedback equalizer, we need to make sure that the uh, bit error rate is low enough. Otherwise, it results in error propagation. So it has to be together with the feedforward error correction that in 1G it was simply doable because we used uh, uh, Viterbi decoder, and Viterbi decoder had very low latency, but uh, because of the 10 dB gain we need, uh, it resulted in uh, uh, higher latency, and therefore we had to do it in the transmitter side through uh, Tom Lison Hiroshima. And that will lead to 10 bits at the transmit side, that we have to transmit 10 bits instead of 3 bits. That by itself will extend the data input to the filters. Uh, at the same time, the, date, the bit time is 1.25 nanosecond in 10G, while in uh, 1G it was 8 nanosecond. And that by itself will extend the length of the filter to cover the uh, cable by this ratio. And lastly, the amount of uh, cancellation we have to do is 20 dB higher. So putting all that together just for the uh, cancelers, we see that we have the 30 times uh, larger or more complex uh, filter requirement that to achieve that, we need to use significant uh, optimization and innovation. On top of that, in 1G, uh, the data bandwidth was up to like 62 and a half uh, giga megahertz, which was uh, all the FCC uh, uh, data transmission or s frequencies was above that. We could simply put a low pass filter. In 10G, we have 400 megahertz, uh, and we cannot simply use a, a low pass filter. Originally, conventionally, the, the approach was to put a notch filter whenever a single uh, frequency is detected, to put a notch filter to suppress uh, that filter. But that interference frequency. But the problem with that was, first of all, the link had to be interrupted for you know, tens of milliseconds. And at the same time, uh, the data itself was getting notched. So the power of the data was uh, uh, eaten up, and the, the performance came down. So the approach we took was, in fact, we detect the interference to a special technique that we have, then we feed it to similar cancelers as the you know, echo canceller, next canceller, and it directly can subtract it from the data. And that has the advantage that there is no link interruption, uh, there is no uh, data uh, degradation or link performance degradation, and we can also address multiple tones uh, or even wide band data. Next on the analog side, uh, there are a like number of challenges. One of the challenges is that we have to provide less than one picosecond of uh, jitter. And for that, just a simple example is that uh, you have to, if you want to cancel you know, echo at a certain point, and because of jitter, you cancel at a different point, that delta will result in an error in cancellation. The other thing is that, of course, the receive paths should have better than 60 dB SNR performance, the whole thing. And especially the fact that on the transmit side, we are doing a bidirectional link. Um, and the transmit signal is 45 dB stronger than the receive side, 
no matter how much digital equalization we can do, if the distortion of the transmit is worse, and because all the cancellation we do is linear, we cannot do anything about the distortion. So the distortion has to be 60 dB less. Here I'm going to show some of the different approaches that people have taken in the past. This is an innovative way of doing the, the hybrid cancellation or the transmit signal cancellation, which is on the same line, which is using passive lines that, as you see, there is a delay line that transmit signals goes to, through the line and a similar delay line that feeds it back to the receiver. So as you see, the transmit signal going through these two paths will be the same. When one subtracted, they will go away, and only the receive signal that is going through a different path will appear at the output. That has the advantage, of course, you only use one uh, uh, TX stack, but a uh, number of disadvantages. First of all, any mismatch in these paths, as I explained earlier, any picosecond mismatch re result in degradation of the performance. Also, also for each lane, uh, we have to have 40 inches of uh, copper of wire uh, for these uh, uh, files, that becomes a nightmare, rotting not nightmare. And also for uh, RF, or let's say emission, FCC emission or RF emission power, because we cannot control the edge rates uh, of these DACs to certain limit, because as the more capacitor we put at these outputs, it results in uh, degradation of the uh, return loss, there's limits it, and that, that's why there's so much that we can limit uh, the RFI emission. This is another approach that eliminates the lines, but we have like a replica DAC, a similar DAC to this uh, TX DAC, which has the advantage that it removes the, the, the complexity of the routing, but adds more power, it needs uh, two DACs, and at the same time, uh, the distortion of these two DACs will add up and everything, and it still has the problem of the RFI emission. The approach we took is basically using a single DAC and using some sort of like an analog mirroring to fit the thing, uh, to fit the line, and has clear the advantage we only use one DAC, no uh, long traces. Uh, and of course, the big advantage here is that by controlling the capacitance here, isolated from the line, so it doesn't affect the return loss, but we can very well control the RFI emission. And as a result, uh, we can basically, in switches that are like 48 ports, we pass the uh, RFI emission without any problem, even using the long cables, while the other approaches, they have problems unless they use shorter cables to get the advantage of the TX power. This is just quickly touching uh, uh, on the, uh, some of the power management stuff that we do. Uh, as you see, as you go to finer and finer technologies, 40 nanometer uh, is the latest technology that we use. There's significant variation, even within a single, uh, single wafer, uh, we have two to three sigma variation. You see the whole process uh, variation on a single wafer. And this shows kind of the leakage of different wafers, as you can see. And with leakage being a significant problem, uh, we don't want to end up with chips that uh, one has significant power than the other one. Leakage can be at easily 50% of the overall power. So to mitigate that and to have like a relatively flat power, independent of the corner of the process, we, do, uh, th we use different techniques such as batch back biasing that adjusts the threshold of the devices. Uh, if there's like low threshold, you are in the fast corner. And even if that's not enough, we use the supply scaling. If the part is still fast, we reduce the supply and take advantage of the V squared power scaling. And we all do that through the microcontroller that we have on chip and uh, using the, some of the analog leakage and speed monitors that we have on chip and different places on the chip to detect you know, how fast the chip is, which corner of the process is, and also depending on the temperature, it knows how to adjust the bag biasing and supply scaling very smartly. And all of this is done through uh, firmware control. Uh, as uh, we showed you in the top level architecture, <clears throat> we have a, a controller uh, that uses a firmware with over 100K of lines. I mean, this, this, this thing took us like about a year to really optimize it and come to the best uh, performance, depending on how we optimize things, how we fine tune things, and a different calibration in terms of analog and uh, digital that we do to actually meet the performance. I mean, there was no way that we could use you know, hard-coded state machines that was done in uh, gigabit, for example, and people have done that. That was a failure uh, on their side. So this thing was a huge uh, uh, help to get the performance for 10G as we needed. And uh, <clears throat> lastly, uh, at the conclusion, the 
basically the cloud computing and server virtualization is driving the demand for a Tenji requirement, a Tenji link. And this link has to, for it to happen, has to be fairly inexpensive and easy to deploy and practical. And Tenji based D is the best solution as long as it is low power and also low area to result in uh, inexpensive uh, solutions for these options. And by technology getting mature, is getting there. And Aquanti has been the leader uh, in, in, in that front. Uh, our 90 nanometer chip uh, came out in 2009, the production uh, version of it. And uh, in fact, um, it's currently in the multiple switches platform. Uh, the first uh, switch shipped out of Cisco uh, was in fact using the 90 nanometer chip from Aquantia. And uh, for our 40 nanometer, which is currently in production, we started in early uh, 2009, doing the, all the analog chip, doing all the analog front ends, making sure everything is perfect. We did multiple test chips. And uh, getting the confidence on that, in 2010, it was sampled and currently uh, is in production and ramping up very fast. Thank you very much. Oh, of course, if there are any questions that we can answer. Satoshi Matsushita NEC. Uh, this product is quite attractive for me. Um, I have two questions. And the first one is uh, the uh, LDPC for the collection or the filter or uh, the uh, more latency in the file. Because the file is uh, used in the uh, um, a lot of FI is used in the transmission line. And I, I'm, I wonder the, the, the latency of the FI, the increase of the latency of the FI. How much do, latency do you expect for the FI? Uh, so, uh, yeah. so the standard calls for 2.5 microseconds of latency total in the receive and the transmit. And with everything that we've shown in, these, uh, uh, in this presentation, we're still within that two and a half microsecond, right? Our, our architecture from uh, DSP perspective and filter perspective is in time domain, right? So we save on latency in that perspective, and we give some back on the LDPC. But we're, we're well within the two and a half microsecond that the standard asks for. OK. And then the second question is uh, the, the RF error and the noise, external noise, because that LDPC, once that the LDPC synchronization is lost, it takes a long time to learn the synchronization between the files. So I heard that it is a millisecond order. So is, do, how, you improve the, the RF noise tolerance and the uh, AC uh, uh, input po supply power noise late, uh, immunization. And then, have you ever found that such kind of synchronization loss in, in the for the correction? Yeah, basically, in the first approach, as I mentioned, uh, for it to detect where to put the notch at the, the interfering frequency, there is that certain period. I mean, can, as I mentioned, up to like 10 milliseconds or more uh, for it to for the link to recapture itself and to capture that lock of the frame and everything and do some uh, minor retuning of the filters. So that happens. But in the second approach, as I mentioned, because as soon as you detect the data, it immediately goes through the cancellation filter and cancels it. You don't have that interruption anymore. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Can, can you? Um... Uh, comment on um, base T versus uh, the, the, the SFP, the cage approach, where um, it's, in, in, in my opinion, it looks like the world's been tra trending from, from base T to cage approach. And um, can you comment on the power of your devices versus SFP plus modules? Uh, and I, I guess the latency is going to be a lot less on the uh, SFP plus modules. Yeah, certainly SFP plus modules, latency is lower and the power is lower. But again, if you look at every generation of internet, right, from 10 to 100 to gigabit, once you get deployment of 10G based integrated MacFi onto the server, right, and once you see two RJ45s on your server, which ships standard, right, which ships, you know, at almost no cost to you, then the server side will actually take off. And to 
get a SFP cage and try to do a pluggable module or mezzanine into the server is really not you know, that practical. Now, I'm sure that they will coexist, but our view of the market as we move forward, and surely Romley generation will be a testament to that, is that over the next six to nine months, you're going to see significant server takeoff with integrated MacFi uh, on the motherboard. And once you have it on the server side, the switch side will follow. Uh, yes, uh, with such uh, high complexity and uh, um, tight specs, has there been uh, any history of uh, interoperability problems between different people's files? Absolutely, absolutely. So we've had significant interoperability issues. In fact, the, most of the interoperability comes from the interpretation of the two-second training. And uh, there's been a lot of back and forth. Actually, the standard was ratified. Then we went back to standard that opened it up for uh, additional um, addendums to the standard to account for interoperability issues. And in all honesty, if it wasn't for having the processor and the firmware, the interoperability issues could never be resolved. But there's been, been quite a few, and we've, we've taken care of them. Thank you. All right, thank you. OK. Thank you. Okay, I don't know if people picked up on that, but just to highlight the challenge of the, that problem there, they, they talked about doing terabit ops, and guys like me from Cisco would tell them it's got to be five watts or less. So it's not easy.